Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rob Fisher. I'm a faculty member at the Mandel School at Case Western Reserve. I want to welcome you to today's uh, webinar on the art of fundraising. Uh, I'm really excited about this uh, panel. This has been one we've been talking about for several months, and I think we just are going to have a great conversation about a, a hugely important topic. As we think about the sector over the last two years, we've gone through kind of unprecedented challenges uh, for many nonprofits and fundraising. Uh, while in the short term, there's been good amounts of influx of fundraising for uh, particular categories of need um, from uh, many of our philanthropic partners, uh, still the ongoing duress of many organ organizations feeling very, um, the pressures to keep budgets low and um, be very frugal in how they do their jobs. Uh, we've just seen uh, the you know tremendous fragility of many nonprofits over the last two years. So I think this this uh, conversation comes at a great time for us to rethink how we're how we're doing this uh, approach to our our supporters and our uh, partners. Um, so. Uh, I'll just say that this is part of uh, the school's uh, ongoing uh, work around our nonprofit management leadership series. Um, and while we're still in a webinar mode, uh, we hope to one day uh, welcome everybody back to campus. And uh, Dean Sharon Milligan sends her, her, her best to everyone on the call and thanks you for uh, making time to join us today. So with that, I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Dan Mansour. Uh, who will be leading us through this with our panelists. Um, I'll just say a couple words about Dan. Uh, you should have his bio and the uh, information that was provided for the meeting, but uh, Dan has uh, three decades of experience in, in nonprofit fundraising, uh, cut his teeth in university uh, work many years ago, uh, founded something uh, called Good Works uh, Group, um, providing uh, consultation and uh, advice to many organizations. And many of you in the region probably know him. Um, he also roosted at United Way for a couple of years as their uh, chief philanthropy officer here in Cleveland. Um, I've gotten to work with Dan a lot over the last two years. He's been an uh, instructor with us at, in our master's nonprofit organizations degree program. Uh, for many years. Um, and in the last two years, Dan and I have worked on a study of the needs of nonprofit fundraisers uh, with support from the, the Kelvin and Eleanor Smith Foundation. And we're in a place where we're developing a new uh, certificate in nonprofit fundraising um, and uh, not surprising, seeking funding uh, for that work to bring that uh, professional development cert certificate uh, out to the sector. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. And uh, again, thanks to the panelists and thanks to all our guests. Thanks, Rob. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my comments will be really brief so we can get right to our panelists. Um, let me start by saying that um, um, these are unusual times. Um, if you've heard me present before, I've talked about what I call three fatigues. Um, a giving fatigue. I think donors are tired of the process of giving. They're still giving, but they don't really enjoy the process. Uh, the second is solicitation fatigue, both from volunteers and from staff. Incredibly high turnover um, in the professional industry, so many people leaving the industry, and volunteers seeming tired of the ongoing roles they play in asking people to make gifts. And the third fatigue I call uh, attention fatigue. It's just we can't get anyone's attention. Um, uh, we're so distracted by so much going on. Um, today, we're really talking uh, about the second, um, really about the ability for fundraisers to do a more effective job. And I believe personally, we have to break out of some of the mold, uh, some of the uh, traditions and habits that we've been at. Um, one, both to inspire ourselves and our colleagues, um, and the second, to be more successful than uh, we're even as successful as we are today. I'll, I'll also mention briefly um, the reminder that today Americans will give away about $1 billion. So the issue isn't whether we have to convince people to be generous and altruistic. It is how do we get attention for our organization and uh, in, make our donors enjoy their experience. 
Um, with that said, um, the last, uh, I came across a quote, which I like, which says a wise person is somebody who learns from others. Um, therefore, all of you listening in today are very wise because you are going to be learning from our panelists today. I'm asking them to do a brief introduction and then just share a few thoughts that come to mind and I'll continue with the conversation and ask questions. Um, please take advantage of the chat to pose questions at any time. Um, Rob and Anne-Marie will monitor those and either ask directly or um, ask me to present them. So um, without further ado, since on my screen, she's closest to me, uh, Haley Marblestone. Uh, welcome and please introduce yourself. Hi, Dan, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be on this panel today and thank you all so much for being here. Um, as Dan said, my name is Haley Marblestone. Um, I am currently working at Cleveland Site Center and I have been the development manager, manager there for the past two years. Cleveland Site Center's mission is to help people who are blind or visually impaired to reach their full potential and to help shape the community's vision of that potential. Um, I recently graduated from John Carroll with my Master's of Art in Nonprofit Administration. Um, and previous to my current role, I've just worked at various nonprofits in the Cleveland area to get nonprofit and fundraising experience. Thank you. Marcella, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Marcella Brown, I am the Vice President of Development and Communications for Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. Um, LMM is a social service organization with a focus on not just being a provider of social services, uh, but also being an advocate with and for the people um, that we serve. Uh, we work in the community in three key areas, and that includes housing and shelter, health and wellness services, as well as workforce development. Um, and a key um, really demographic of the people that we serve, a significant number of whom are people of color. Um, many of the individuals we serve are restored citizens and a pretty fair amount are also people who are experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity. Um, so that's really the focus of our work at LMM. Um, I've been doing fundraising now for um, almost 20 years, which is odd to say, um, but am a graduate of the MNO MN program at uh, Case as well. Thank you. And Patrick. Uh, good to be with you all this afternoon. My name is Patrick Grace. I'm the executive director of the Catholic Community Foundation. Uh, we are the fundraising arm for the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland, which is an eight county represents an eight county region in Northeast Ohio. Uh, our primary role is to raise money for the social service ministry of the church in Northeast Ohio, as well as the Catholic schools that provide uh, education to students in the uh, eight counties of diocese, as well as other needs that are represented in the faith-based uh, uh, spectrum under the, the auspices of the Catholic diocese. I've been with the diocese for about 25 years, uh, 10 years as director of the Catholic foundation and Prior to that, I spent about five years working for a national fundraising consultant. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Thanks, guys. Um, let me ask the first question. Um, let's let's couch it under the sort of concept of art versus science or art versus um, you know, formal process and techniques. Um, what to you? Um, what does art of fundraising mean to you? And what personal or um, unique or individual perspectives do you bring to your work? That you, you that you feel um, sort of fits under the label of art, uh, Haley. Let's 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 start with you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So you know, in terms of you know, I think in order to talk about the art, you first got to understand what part of that is the science. So I think the the science of fundraising is really you know it's everything you do before meeting with that donor. It's the research you do, the data that you collect, the studying of the trends that you do. It's the you know everything that you need to do beforehand research about the individual, et cetera. Um, but I think that the art is really about everything you do after that. It's about what happens with the donor, the authenticity you bring, the passion for your cause that you bring, your relationship with your donor, and also your gut instinct. I think sometimes gut can play a lot into something. You know, if you're not ready, if you were there to make an ask and it doesn't seem like it's the right time, you, you back off. Um, I think that sci the science, the fundraising, it might get you to the table but the art is what like helps you actually close the deal and continue to have that long-term relationship with the donor. Um, in terms of my personal perspective, um, I'm 
I think that um, getting my my master's degree in this and just kind of um, coming up through the field and learning from people of the industry that um, from that I admire and then also putting my own personal spin on it. You know, I'm young. I can talk to them about, um, you know, I can I can really I relate to people in a different way. Um, and I think just my passion comes through and um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank Thanks. Marcella. Yeah, so I really like what what Haley said, um, because I agree you definitely walk into a situation having done your homework. Um, so, you know, just the process of the research, identify, qualify, all of those things um, need to be done in advance. But I really look at um, the art of fundraising as, um, you know, 80% is just relationship building. Um, it's getting to know the person. And of course, this is after you've done, you know, the science of it is spending time getting to know someone. Um, I know that a lot of uh, people who serve on boards really get nervous about fundraising. Um, it's something that they don't really look forward to. Um, and what I usually say to a board member or someone serving on our fund development committee is that, you know, if you spend 80% of your time building a relationship, then by the time you get to the end of that 80%, it's almost awkward if you haven't asked for money yet because they know that that's what's coming. So if you really front load the relationship building part, then the ask itself really comes very naturally. Um, so, you know, my focus is, you know, when I'm in the presence of a donor or I'm vetting someone over time um, is to kind of meter myself um, because I may be ready to run 100 miles per hour straight into this. Um, but then as I engage with the person, I'm paying attention to the little things. And I, I think that fundraising, the art of it is that it's behavioral. So you're really paying attention to what are the things that the donor is telling you, listen well, um, figure out what their, their real interests are. You may walk into it thinking they're really excited about children, but it's something completely different by the end of the conversation or the, the meeting or the coffee um, you know, uh, discussion. And so you have to uh, kind of slow down and pay attention to what the behavior of the person or the, the funder is, is really telling you about what, what really matters to them the most. Um, because even all the research in the world uh, doesn't really explain that sometimes our behavior and our feelings don't make sense. You know, so you, it's, it's almost like when you're deciding to make a major purchase or, you know, what outfit to wear, you can have the sense of like, oh, I want to wear this dress because I'm going to this formal event and it just makes sense. But then you put it on and you're like, oh, but it just doesn't feel right. So sometimes what we do is behavioral in the sense that we often make decisions, even though we have all the knowledge in the world, we make decisions based upon our feelings. And so your job, really that 80% of relationship building is to figure out what is it that the donor's behavior is telling you that all the research that you did just does not explain, you know, like there's that gap and you, your job really is to figure out what is that gap in order to get to that 20%, which is the ask. That's great. Thank you. I was about to ask you, you know, how does one build relationships? Um, but I, I think the obvious is asking questions. Um, when, I, when I've done training for volunteers and board members, um, I often say that successful fundraising is based on 80% listening and 20% talking. Um, and by asking questions, you do discover anything from, you know, what inspires your philanthropy? Where did you learn how to give money away? How did you learn to be altruistic? Um, and people like to talk, <laughs> uh, which means I should shut up right now and turn it over to Patrick. Yeah, I'll just pick up, Dan, on, on something you and Marcella both touched upon in the relationship uh, context. Uh, I was listening and learning, and you said one of the things, Dan, you alluded to, that you've learned a lot listening to others and watching others. Uh, particularly as it relates to your own knowledge in, in the profession. And Marcella talked about the, the importance of relationships. I heard something a couple of years ago, not that long ago, that described, this is in the context of major gift fundraising, but I think it applies to the art of this conversation. And this particular consultant described effective fundraisers, particularly speaking of major gift officers, as curious chameleons. chameleons. And I thought that struck me very uh, as a truism because uh, for those of us that are engaged in the relationship, uh, on any given day, I might be in a conversation with an 80-year-old or 75-year-old widow um, and be sitting in his or her living room. 
uh, having a cup of tea or coffee uh, and talking with that individual about and asking her questions about her history, her story, what, why she continues to give, what motivates her, asking the type of questions that, that you and Marcella were discussing uh, as well as Haley. Uh, and then an hour later, I could be sitting in, in, in the office of a, uh, an executive at a company uh, who, and that conversation I'm gonna have with that executive is looking to look very different uh, than it would have been with that 80 year old widow. And then I might conclude the day by talking to one of our board members or perhaps uh, a different individual. And it, over the course of the day or a week, I think successful uh, and effective development professionals learn that, that you need to tailor your message, your tone, uh, your listening skills, quite honestly, and that's the art of this, uh, based upon who your audience is and, and who you're meeting with. Uh, and I think in this complex environment, you have to have all those things. You, you can't be the one trick pony. Uh, we have to be willing to be uh, there to meet with the, those, those elderly individuals who are often the ones making the, the most significant life's transformational gifts, as we all know. Um, but we also need to be uh, speaking to foundation leaders and others who are, are gonna make an impact on our mission as well. So. That, that terminology, that curious chameleon, is something that stuck me, stuck with me. Uh, it was actually the chapter of this book that uh, that I was reading that with this consultant had given us. Thanks. And you remind me of a lesson I learned once. Somebody said fundraising is easy. You just have to ask for the right person for the right amount for the right project at the right time. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, everything has to be right. In fact, there's times when your approach, you know, won't work on a Tuesday, and it might the same approach might work with the donor on another day, it's just the circumstances. And um, we're getting lots of questions and I'd, I'd like to sort of go right to them. Um, I've got someone here who wrote, um, can you also talk about what you're calling the science of giving? And we might get to that in a little bit, um, but they also mentioned that they're new to asking donors and um, it appears that there is a way to qualify donors prior to asking. Um, I don't know if any of you wanna talk about you know, what you do, what process or thinking goes behind determining whether somebody you've identified is in fact an appropriate prospect, either an amount or for your organization or project. You want me to go first? We'll go back. Sure, first, if that sure. We're, we're all friends. Yeah. Our egos are Fair secure. Enough. Any order is fine. Yeah, I, I think as it relates to that, I saw that question in the chat, the science of fundraising, there is a methodology that is probably consistent um, throughout most, if not all nonprofits, although there is some uniqueness that all of us deploy to, to connect with individuals who support our mission. And so traditionally that science would include things like every organization needs to develop some type of an annual fund. Whether you're a large organization or small organization, people have a need to connect with you and to give to you, whether through a membership or an annual fund. And that relates to any organization. It's kind of a, a, a simplistic baseline engagement that is, uh, you know, you could call it the science, you could call it the must start with or the, the baseline of engagement. I think that's the science. And then it begins, uh, there are other steps that step someone forward in their relationship with your organization uh, that might uh, invite a, a deeper uh, engagement with your organization based upon uh, their giving. And, and that's what really helps the qualification. I think, Dan, is what it boils down to is, so people uh, want to be engaged by, and they demonstrate that by, by their interests and expressing interest to you that they want to be engaged. And we need to be as fundraisers asking them, do they want to be engaged with us? So qualification, I think, begins with certainly recency of giving. Are they giving to you, number one? Uh, number two, do they want to be in a relationship with you? Um, that's an important question I think we have to ask of our donors. And usually they tell you that by you asking or them by continuing to give. Uh, and then if, if you're looking at growing that individual support, it's, it's asking the questions and, and starting to understand what their capacity would be and really how do they wanna make a difference in your mission. And, and through that process that uncovering, you're gonna qualify uh, that person or persons and have them better, be in a better position to know what their level of support might look like um, and how, the, how you might grow. Yeah. I think those are really Wanna great add? points. I, I would just add, you know, one of the key things that I think that contributes to the science of it is having the right systems in place. Um, so having a really good uh, donor uh, management system uh, really kind of gets you over the hump of a lot of the initial vetting that you're going to do with, with fundraising. And it could be that 
you know, if you're trying to get new people into your fundraising pipeline, there are external resources that you can utilize and tap into to create a good list of potential prospects. Um, your board is going to be a fantastic group of people to tap into because they have wonderful connections and they can speak to the mission um, of the organization. Uh, but once you have people in your system, I think it's, you know, really looking at the data so that it tells you, um, again, going to the behavior of it. So what times of year do people tend to give to your organization? Um, is it in response to a mail campaign or an email um, is it that you all tried something new? Maybe you did a billboard or you did a commercial or you appeared on some sort of public you know, affairs program or something to that effect. So kind of looking at what happened over, you know, over time and having a good system in place, um, a good donor management system is gonna really help you out a lot with that, um, with being able to track donor behavior and assess, you know, kind of what was it that we did this year that was different from last year or more effective over time, you know, look at two or three year patterns, look at five year patterns and be able to uh, identify some of the behaviors, um, both on your end, what do you do as a development professional or, or as a development office, but then also how did your, your donors and your targets respond uh, to those prompts? So I think that that kind of plays into the science of it as well. Yeah, let, me, let me add just a, a comment about science. I, I think there are two kinds of sciences that I'm sort of focused on. One is, and you mentioned it, is data science. You know, do we look at our data to tell us about trends? Um, during my time at United Way, we looked back over 24 years, 500,000 data points, and it told us all sorts of things about the behavior of our donors we just never knew or didn't think or consider. Um, it may have to do with where your donors are located, um, how many of your donors are giving to you, and you have a husband and a wife or a couple giving as opposed to an individual and are they more loyal or more generous than others? Um, the other science is, is the behavioral sciences. Um, behavioral economics has sort of taken the world by storm, um, but it, and it deals with the decision-making and often the irrationality of decision-making, which Patrick mentioned. Um, you know, so I think that you know, understanding how people make decisions and what behaviors we as fundraisers exhibit to encourage those kinds of behaviors is important. I highly encourage um, our audience today to read anything by Dick Thaler about behavioral economics and start asking, you know, does any of this apply to the nonprofit sector? Um, if it applies to how we buy cars, it certainly um, can apply to how we make decisions in purchasing philanthropy or helping the world. Um, yeah, I would just add one thing about um, qualifying. I think that everyone did a great job speaking about uh, the science of giving and qualifying. Um, in terms of qualifying donors, I think that one thing that always helped me think about qualifying is that only about usually about one in three of your donors actually want to have a relationship with you. So there's, you know, there's definitely donors that just want to keep giving on a regular basis, small or large, but don't really want to have that, that hands-on experience. And then there's those people that actually want to, um, to learn more about the impact they're making and have that relationship with you. And those are the people that you can really, um, you can really make a difference with and help um, bring their gift up. So when you're talking, you know, it's easy to get down when you're not getting calls back from donors and stuff. But when I think about it, we're like one in three people are gonna want to, to engage more. That's helpful for me. Uh, let me also add just, a, you know, sometimes people wanna have a relationship with you. We shouldn't measure, measure um, not unreturned phone calls and unreturned emails as an indication. Uh, more and more I discover that, you know, five minutes after sending an email, um, your email is now two pages deep in your recipient's uh, email box and they forget about it and they don't get back. Can't tell you the number of times the second or sometimes even the third email gets an immediate response saying, gee, sorry, I didn't get back to you. I've just been swamped. Um, but that is a good point. All right, we've got a, a question here. Um, Boards can be resistant to fundraising, how to inspire and engage members to offer their personal networks and make introductions. Um, so how does, um, you know, we're taking a little bit of a tangent here from the fundraising to focus on how do we inspire our uh, board members and volunteers 
Um, there was a study, I'm gonna say it's 15 years ago from the Chronicle of Philanthropy, asked executive directors uh, of these 20 items, what do you want more of, of your board members? And it was fundraising. And they asked the board members of these 20 items, what do you least like to do? And they say fundraising. Well, we've got a fundamental problem in our industry. If what we need from our board members and what they want to do are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, Patrick, I'd like to turn to you only because as an executive director, you might see that um, more prevalent yeah. than. Yeah, one of our board members, uh frequently says to me, ask me for advice and I'll give you money, ask you for money and I'll give you advice. Uh, and oftentimes our board are, 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 can be categorized as such. But I think when we think of board members, uh, uh, the, the definition of what fundraising needs is gonna be different depending on the board members engagement with us. And there's a lot of way, yeah, we know, and I think it's, you said it, uh, Dan, that most board members don't wanna ask, right? They, they don't wanna ask their peers, their contemporaries or friends, whatever the case might be. Uh, and if we approach it just as that much of a black and white issue, it, 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 it's gonna naturally be, be met with some resistance. But I think if we ask our board to tell stories, to tell about their own journey with your organization, and I'll give you a good example. We have a, a board member who we literally just went to them and said, tell us your story. We're gonna highlight you in a publication that's gonna go out to 230,000 households in this situation, the printed publication. Tell us your story. Uh, and then we did that. And then we did a video of that story. So we not only do we have it in the magazine, if you will, they were just telling about why they give, what, what was important to them and how did our mission connect with them personally. We then did it in a video that we pushed out as well. Um, and it, again, the board member wasn't asking for money, but in my opinion, that board member was very much part of the fundraising mission of our organization. Um, actually, it turned out that, that uh, even as recently as a month ago, the donor came to us and said that their, one of their children ended up making a $100,000 gift to us uh, in honor of these, their parents, the two people that we were highlighting through this story. We didn't ask for a penny. Uh, all I did was ask the board member to tell his and his wife's story, as it turns out. And, they, and, and that story has generated interest in, in more conversations uh, that we can then have with, with donors. So, I think one of the ways I would answer that, Dan, is, is how do you define fundraising? I think we need to engage our board in telling the story, telling and sharing the mission of our organization. Yes, it is helpful uh, if the, you have some board members who are willing to sit with you on an ask or to be with you on an ask. Um, but if you just jump into that right away, that's going to be that, that may not be the best way for some board members to become engaged in the fundraising enterprise. So I think we have to look for, we have to be creative. And we have to think of ways to engage our board that may not be as black as white as that sounds when that study comes out of you know how many people like to be engaged in fundraising. Well, yeah. how do you define that? Yeah, no, it, it, you bring up a good point. Um, I, I'm smiling because at four o'clock I have to do a presentation for uh, a board of a nonprofit on how to get them more engaged in the fundraising. So thanks for all the hints. Um, one of my messages is uh, most boards don't understand the difference between development and fundraising. Um, they view when they're being asked to help um, either to write a check and or to ask or to fundraise. And what I like to point out is that there are a multitude of other activities and you guys already touched on this fact in, in that we can do to develop a relationship. And these are tasks that board members are more than willing to do meet with a donor, invite them to walk through the organization with you, to host an event, um, to simply suggest some names um, um, and you know, allow us to do some research before we approach them. One of the resistance I think from board members is, well, I'm on this board, can you want my Rolodex for anybody in the audience who knows what a Rolodex is? Um, you want the list of the people I hang out with. Um, no, what I want of them is to look at that list and say, who a year from now is gonna come back to me and say, thanks, Dan, for introducing me to this organization. You know me well enough to know that this is the kind of organization um, I would wanna be involved with and would want to su support. Um, Marcella, Haley, anything to add? I would just add that I know um, for many organizations I have been involved with, the board tends to also be some of the most significant donors. Um, so it could be that their interests may have already been expressed in other ways. So to kind of transition them from oftentimes being a donor to being the person kind of driving the charge behind that, I think is to just 
really support them as much as you can. Um, so I look at uh, volunteers very similarly to how I look at donors because e both audiences are giving to the organization. But at every level, um, whether it's a donor or a volunteer, they need to be engaged, motivated, and then supported. And so my focus with that is the first meeting that I have with a board member, a volunteer, or a donor, I'm not asking for anything. Um, I'm really just taking the moment to let them get to know who I am, what interests me, and why I work for the organization that I work for. And then I'd love for them to answer the same question, you know, why are you giving of your time or your talent or treasure to the organization and oftentimes getting them to say it in a way that's humanizing um, kind of helps them to craft their elevator pitch, right? So then I can literally say to them, you know what you just said? I'd love for you to share that with the people who are close to you, your friends, your family, your employer or others. And so kind of helping them slowly but surely build up that confidence and that ability to share why they are investing in the organization is exactly what you want them to go out and tell 20 of their friends. And so for me, it's a slow process of engaging board members and helping to break down that wall and that fear of like, I don't wanna ask anyone for money. Um, again, going back to my earlier point, if they can humanize why they are involved and say it in a way that's inspiring and use that to build a relationship with a potential donor or funder, um, then they've they've done that 80%. And that's what you want them to do. And it's really our job as development professionals to support the development of their 80%. You know, so what materials can I give you? What information can I give you? What events do you want to bring people to that will expose them to the mission and the work of the organization? Um, and that's really how, you know, I kind of focus my time is building the confidence of the board member, but setting a relationship with them so that they can then carry that information and that humanized relationship forward to others. You know, there's an adage in our field that we really don't ask for money. Um, we give people opportunities to make a difference, to change the world, to change organizations. Um, you know, there might be a parallel when we think about going into a clothing store, or buying a car, the first thing that comes out of the, the seller's mouth, whether it's a, um, a car salesman or, or, uh, or uh, a customer service person at a store isn't, by the way, the sweater you're looking at costs X. Um, you want to, you describe the, you describe the product, um, you, uh, you make your people want it, you want them to say, I like this, what does it cost? Um, but uh, I've always sort of liked that notion when people say I'm scared to ask for money, tell people I've never asked for money. There might be that point where they bring up the subject um, and you say, well, if you're gonna be so crude to talk about money, it's a $25,000 investment. Um, uh, I, I, let me shift uh, briefly here. Um, we have a question. Um, what's the role of a CEO in your approach to fund development? Um, please describe how you utilize a CEO in your organizations and your prospecting cultivation of donors. Haley, do you want to touch that? Sure. I think that um, the first thing is it really depends on who your CEO is, what their focus is, what their comfortability level is with fundraising, and how much they want to be involved. I think that at its best, um, your CEO is, is right there with you. You know, you're working together on the major gift prospects. Um, you um, you know, you're getting that person involved when they need to be involved, but you're kind of taking it usually from the first step. But I also think that there's a lot of CEOs that, um, you know, fundraising isn't their expertise and it's not something that they want to be as involved in. And I think that when you have CEOs like that, you have to take it from a little bit of a different direction. And with people like that, I think it's more about how can we work together to help fulfill the mission of this organization. Oh. Um, and, and kind of working with them to understand that in order to achieve the mission of this organization, fundraising com comes in hand with that. And then giving them the information they need to feel comfortable in the fundraising situations. Um, I think that, that oftentimes, you know, we, we see the CEO's role so much as fundraising, but also so often the CEO just isn't comfortable with it. So sometimes it's kind of more of a hand in hand um, to, get them com to get them comfortable. I want to add, I think there was a time when the CEO or executive director could get by not being a fundraiser. I think those days are behind us. Um, you know, if you as a development officer 
um, or an executive director are looking for a successor in that position, I would make sure your voice is heard that this is a, an essential skill um, to lead an, or a nonprofit today. Um, there was a time when I got involved in this profession when people were asked, you know, do you want to be president of a university or dean of a college? Um, and they said, sure, but I, I really, you know, I'm happy to go talk to the alumni, but I don't want to fundraise. And, you know, the response back then was, no, oh, okay. Um, that's not the response today. Um, the response is, no, we need you out to be out there um, finding interest in donors, finding um, uh, resources for your organization and your institution. And we're seeing many um, nonprofit, many fundraising professionals stepping up into the executive director and leadership positions because they've got that talent and they tend to know the organization intimately as well. Um, we've had two questions about um, donor acquisition. Um, you know, how do we get more donors? Um, I don't know if anybody wanted to address that in one case or both cases. Actually, they were fairly young and new organizations, and there are probably some separate strategies for that. Um, but um, if anyone wants to chime in on any um, experiences they've had and any recommendations. Yeah. I think one way, especially if you're a newer organization, oftentimes um, new organizations tend to start off with events. Um, although of course in a, in a COVID environment, that's not fully possible. Um, but you know, a lot of organizations historically have events and you may have systems in place that you're using to register people for some of your events. Um, a lot of organizations use Eventbrite, for example. Um, and just, you know, come, you know, recognize that that's a source of information for potential donors. Um, if you have hundreds of people who are registering for your events, um, and maybe you have a source of data that you can upload into your donor management system, I would strongly encourage you to, to do that. Um, I worked with an organization prior that had, you know, seven, 800 people register for different events throughout the year, and they weren't doing that conversion of donor records. Um, and that's a significant source of potential funders. One, uh, because they've already expressed interest in your organization. If they have been exposed to you by way of an event, um, or maybe they subscribe to you via social media, um, then I would definitely say that those are all sources of donor conversion. Um, and so if you're maybe an older organization and you have a really big mailing list, for example, that's still a great source of information because what you could do at some point during the year is to maybe send out a mailing to everyone on your, your hard copy list and encourage them to join your email. Um, and then from there, you can, once they are, you know, convert from being people who just receive mailings to also receiving um, emails, then you can further engage them and encourage them to convert from being just email subscribers to also being social media followers. So I would say start with the systems that you already have because new donor acquisition can be very expensive if you're looking at some of the higher end systems. Um, and if you're a smaller or new nonprofit that may be difficult to, to you know, to, um, to advocate for budget wise, but you may already have systems that you can develop further or tap into, and that, that can be sources of new donor acquisition. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, look at every possible touch point that people have with your organization too. If they're coming to the front desk, there's a place for them to sign in and put their email address. If they're coming to an event, um, if, and, and anytime you're talking about the organization, um, it grows exponentially, um, but um, as you pointed out, it takes a lot of effort. I have to say, tell the people the story of Charity Water. I don't know if people are familiar with this organization, but uh, they were a fairly new organization, I think now 20 years ago, um, very innovative, um, but they bought a mailing list. Um, but it wasn't the buying of the mailing list that um, was the brilliance. What the, the brilliance was the letter. The letter basically said, don't you hate getting unsolicited mail? I certainly know I do. So, you know, if you're not interested in what I'm about to say, then just send this back and we promise to remove you from this, our mailing list. Um, and they gave them three options. They gave them the option to just return the note, pay postage paid. Um, they gave them a note saying, no, I like your organization, but I definitely don't want to be on your list. Here's a check. And the third choice was, no, you guys sound interesting. You know, I'd like to stay on your list. It got them the most response of any mailing they did, even to their regular donors. People were respected because, you know, they felt they were in control and, 
the organization was uh, respecting um, the kinds of decisions that you know needed to be made by the individual. Um, but I, I do like that. Um, I want to transition to this question because this is a really interesting question. Um, how do you develop a quality relationship with a donor who does not like you because of your race, age, size, gender, culture, or previous history with members of the organization? Um, and in the case of Patrick, may not like our hairstyle. Um, Patrick and me that might not might not like our hairstyle. So. Um, this is a serious issue, and it's one that obviously uh, is more than relevant in today's world. So anyone? Let me add to that. You know, it says, how do you develop a relationship? Maybe the, the, the related question is, should you develop a relationship with someone like that? So I think this is something that can definitely be uncomfortable at times. Um, I know for myself, I now work for an organization that is, um, that is faith-based and also a significant portion of the donors are not people of color. And so being a woman and also a person of color, that definitely can, you know, put me in a situation where sometimes I'm anxious about that, or I might feel a little bit of unease about presenting myself to a donor or, um, you know, just starting that, that conversation or, or going down that road. Um, I really look at my um, role and responsibility is to make the issues and the mission and the work that we're doing, um, again, humanized. And so, you know, I'm not necessarily just having a conversation with them because I know that they have money and they're willing to give it. Um, on the other side of that is that I'm an advocate. And so I feel like it's also my role to bring the reality of a situation to a donor or to a funder in a way that maybe they just don't fully understand. Um, so I look at it as an opportunity perhaps to dispel the myths um, because I think you know at times if you're working for an organization maybe that has a focus on people experiencing poverty or people of color or you know people experiencing housing insecurity or other issues, um, there's, there's that perception that, oh, well, you know, maybe they're in this situation because they didn't put forth effort or they didn't try this or they didn't do that. And, you know, our, I think that our job as development professionals, this is more the development and not just the fundraising, is that it's, it's our responsibility not to just ask for money, but also to educate people on the reality of the situations that the people that we're raising money for um, how did they get there? What are they really experiencing? And so I oftentimes, you know, will start a conversation off by, you know, by, by just bringing the truth and the facts um, and, and taking the focus off of me and focusing more so on the issues at hand. You know, why are people experiencing homelessness? Why are people, um, you know, experiencing recidivism? The reality of that. Um, and making it universal so that it's not just a black and white or brown issue. This is a human issue, or it's an issue all across our country. It's an issue all across the world. So helping people to understand that some of the issues, some of the most difficult issues we face as a community and as a country are not siloed to any one race or gender or age or size. It's something that is across the board. Um, and it's something that whether they realize it or not does impact their life. And so that's something that I try to really emphasize when I'm having conversations with donors is the reality that this is not just a me problem. It's not just a, a people of color problem or people in poverty problem. It's an everyone problem. And we need you to help us figure it out together. Thank you. Yeah. I guess one thing I would add just that I think my master's program talked about a lot is do the values of, you know, making sure that the values of your organization and the donor align. And I think that, you know, when those things are not aligning, sometimes it's better to, to, to not engage the donor as much. And so depending on how the, how the donor is interacting with you, and if you feel, you know, that, you know, the values just no longer align with your organization, um, I think, it makes sense to, to, to back off of that um, or to bring someone, you know, get someone else involved because as fundraisers, I think that we can, you know, we want to do everything we can to support our mission, but we also need to like put ourselves in comfortable situations as well and make sure that the people that are giving to us um, align with, with, with our organization. Yeah. And if I could, Dan, just add one other thing, it, it never hurts to bring a friend 
someone who's maybe a mutual friend who can bridge the gap, right? Because I think it's harder for people to show disdain or aggression towards you when someone who you both mutually respect is present. So you definitely want to work relationships um, and maybe bring in a board member or someone who they value and respect, who is more a peer as opposed to this fundraiser who's asking me for money. Great. Thank you. Um, We've got a few questions on how to, you know, on professional development. Um, In some cases, somebody wants to get into the field um, uh, and others who um, just want to expand their knowledge. Um, Let me just preface it from my perspective. Most organizations don't invest in professional development. Um, If they do have funding, it's just minimal. Um, The other concern is, you know, the the one-off conferences other than this Zoom Zoom webinar, which is probably one of the best you'll ever attend. Um, how, How do people develop skills either to get into the field Um, Would you hire someone who hasn't had a lot of development experience um, for something other than an entry level position? And for those who've been in the profession for a while, um, what do you find has been the best way for you to advance your own skills and um, and abilities in the field? Well, I'll start to take this, Dan. I think, uh, first of all, I think you touched upon it at the the outset, and I think this is unfortunately a phenomenon that's happening throughout throughout the labor force right now. The development profession and advancement profession is is definitely um, in a position where there's more opportunities than there are qualified professionals to fill the roles. Uh, And I think many of our organizations are facing that challenge as they are in the for-profit world as well. So it is a very current um, challenge. It's very much something that's on on a plate of all of ours, uh, number one, um, more so now than ever. I, I do think um, as far as skills and, and what we're looking for, depending on the roles we're filling, uh, again, it's it's a challenge, but I think one of the things you know that we're looking for, other than obviously commitment to mission, mission of course, you're looking for that, but um, I think in the, in, the de- in the world of development advancement, sales experience can, can go a long way. Um, Someone who is a good listener uh, goes a long way. That speaks to the sales piece of this. Um, and often I think we do need to step into different professions to engage people who do want to look at the nonprofit as an area where they can uh, either switch careers or begin a career. Um, so I think that, that there are certain skills that are transferable, no question. Um, and, and if you're looking at major gift officers, I know I was talking to the University of Notre Dame um, development head chief advancement, whatever it was, vice president for advancement a number of years ago. And they said, or he said at the time that they look for alums, uh, this is Notre Dame University, who are in the top lead sales positions in companies across the country. And they actually go recruit at those companies for those alums. So let's say it's XYZ individual who's a top salesperson. Uh, They look for those people and they're an alum of Notre Dame. Uh, They look to bring that type of skill or that type of person on to be in their major gift office. Uh, or serve in a major gift office or role. Um, that's just one type. Um, obviously, if you're looking to hire someone who's an annual appeal director, that's a little different uh, and a different skill set that you're looking for, uh, and as opposed to an event coordinator uh, who is much more differently positioned and certainly experience, experience would dictate as such. So I think it really depends on the, the type of position you're bringing into the organization as to what skills you might be looking for. Oh, I, think you're, I think you're right. The idea of, I mean, we are in sales. Um, I think we undervalue, um, simply by their name, we call it soft skills. It's really people skills. Um, uh, I think I would be more interested in high, if I had a choice between hiring somebody who really understood all the mechanisms and mechanics and science and art of of science of fundraising versus somebody who understood the art of people relationships, um, I'd probably go for the latter. Uh, I don't know how the others, others feel. Yeah, I, I would say that um, definitely I'm looking, you know, depending on the position, but I think if it's someone who's going to be more internal, so like a grant writer or something to that effect, I'm looking for someone with great research skills, um, someone who maybe has majored in something where they've done a lot of writing, um, because grant writing, you know, it's definitely, you know, something that requires a certain finesse, but if it's if the person has had a lot of experience with writing, then I think those are very transferable skills. 
Um, but if it's someone who's going to be externally facing, I want them to be really comfortable um, having conversations, but in a way that is welcome and, um, and, you know, feels just feels, you know, comforting to to someone. So if they struggle to have a conversation with me, um, then definitely I'm going to be concerned about their ability to present externally. So just the their their communication skills is going to be key if it's externally facing and the writing and research if internal. We've had uh, two questions about finding affordable and or best grant writers. Um, not so much on topic today, but obviously um, on people's minds. I don't know if you guys have hired outside grant writers, um, what you look for um, and how do you afford them? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I've worked with uh, many grant writer consultants and I think that it can take a while for someone to get to know your organization well enough to write the best grants. But I think that when you're looking for someone, I think that um, seeing that they have written for organizations in your area and seeing how, um, and connecting with those organizations to seeing how they were, I think is always helpful just to, just to get an idea for that. Also, if they've, you know, helped fundraise for organizations similar to yours. Um, I also think that, that um, grant writers have to like really be on all the like they have to change directions a lot. They have to be able to work with your program staff and you and accept the edits back and forth. And they have to be pretty flexible. So those are the things that I usually work for. And also that, you know, our ideas align. Like if, you know, that our writing styles align, things like that. Yeah, Dan, one of the things I, I mean, I don't know if the individual or individuals are asked this question. I think uh, each organization is going to be a little different. Uh, we don't do as much grant funding or grant writing in our organization, but at the end of the day, 75% uh, of all charitable giving is coming from individuals. Uh, certainly grant writing has a place uh, and, and a very important one, I might add. Um, but if you're starting off, so I know there's a number of people here that are new, um, grants can be great for capacity building. They can be great for programs. They can be great for special projects. But one of the things they're not is for operating purposes. And I think there's a misnomer out there that what, what grants can be used to help fund in your organizational mission. Um, again, I think it's important you need to have it, but as you're putting together the building blocks for a successful advancement development uh, plan, uh, know that, that, that again, 75% of your funding is gonna come from individual donors. Uh, and there's a big percentage that can come from bequests and even family foundations. Um, there is a place in there, a sliver in there, don't, don't get me wrong for grants, uh, from foundations and the like, but I just you think you have to be in the put in the context of what your needs are organizationally. I appreciate that. I was <laughs> I'd written down the same thing. You know, sometimes you hear seventy five percent of giving in this country comes from individuals, but as you pointed out, if you add bequests, if you add gifts to family foundations, I think the number is approaching ninety percent. Correct. And yet, and yet, many nonprofits, especially newer ones and sometimes smaller ones, tend to focus on corporations and foundations. I think the reason they do that is they publish their guidelines. They say, here's how you get money from me. If individuals all had a little statement uh, on the back of their personal business cards or their family online website, um, we'd, they'd get a lot more uh, people approaching them. Right. But the, don't forget that uh, most of the giving in this country comes from individuals, which also leads to, you know, where do we find grant writers? Where do we find good writers? Good writers are important. Um, in a time when we seem to be relying more and more on texting and email, a really well-written letter, uh, one that reveals not, you know, stories necessarily, but the soul of the writer and the passion that the writer has about the organization are, are is even more valuable today than I think ever before. Had an interesting question here. We're a new one-year nonprofit um, with a Zoom program in creative, creative programs, crafting offered to shut-ins and multi-generational participants. It's not housing, food, medical service, but they believe it's something communities need to survive and thrive socially and emotionally. Um, it's hard to ask people for money when their mission isn't housing, food, medical services. Um, I, I'll challenge that premise, and I guess those on the call might be as, as well, but I don't know if you guys had any response. And how do we, how do we convince people to give to, I guess, what we might label not charity, but philanthropy 
those things that aren't critical apparently for people to survive. I mean, I think I, I look at the concept that this question is asking is almost a part of behavioral health, um, you know, because right now, you know, COVID has kind of been the great neutralizer for so many people. And it has also brought out the reality of how fragile people's mental, mental health and behavioral health can be in a situation like this and a, in a crisis that has now extended, um, you know, two years and counting. Um, so I think opportunities like this, where people are really reaching a point of desperation, to be honest, um, to engage and connect um, and to do it in a way that, that does not pose risk to themselves, their households, their families, and their communities um, is a critical aspect of our mental well-being and our behavioral health. And I would really position it in that way. Um, you have to tie it into something that uh, rings true for funders um, that helps them understand the urgency of why what you're asking for is important. Um, I mean, definitely food, housing, all of those things are critical needs, um, you know, and, and it addresses our ability to physically survive. Um, but after a certain amount of time, I think we're all starting to see that this situation has had a great impact on a lot of people's mental health as well. And so I think that anything that can tie into perhaps behavioral wellness, um, mental health and well-being is something that a funder, it, a lot of funders are starting to be more open to that. Yeah, I think the only other thing I would add is I think it's about finding the right funders. You know, there's some funders that only care about you know, housing, food, medical services, et cetera. And there's some funders that really do care about the arts. Um, and I think that depending on how you position it, you can really, um, you can you can lead into that a bit. I think just like Marcella said, you know, COVID has really changed our outlook on a lot of this. And I think a friend said to me that's really into the arts. She said something like, you know, the arts has, has been what's kept us, you know, being happy during all this time, right? You can even, you know, say Netflix is how we've all, you know, kind of gotten through this. It's the crafts, it's the making of the bread, you know, it's all the things that we've been doing during COVID. And um, it's what keeps us happy. And I think that the more you can express that in your requests um, and really, you know, sharing stories of how your organization has has helped people, um, giving, you know, the more data and impact you can show, um, I think you and the more um, you know, passion you can put into it, I think you'll um, be better results. All right, we have a little on lull in the questions, but we're actually wrapping up here. What do we have? Oh, it's three o'clock. So I guess I, I'm going to uh, wrap things up for us. I don't know if you guys had any final questions or final comments. Um, uh, as panelists, you've, maybe we've all learned something ourselves today. Um, Marcella, do you want to share any final comments? I would just end by saying um, the one thing that you always have to be prepared for with fund development or fundraising is the no, right? So, <laughs> because not all of your requests will end with a yes. Um, but how I really look at that is that a no for me is not really a no. It's either a not this or a not now. Um, and I really, really take that to heart. So even when you receive a no from a funder or a potential donor, um, one, ask them what, you know, what was it that, that led to the no? Um, and then, you know, take that advice to heart and reconsider, should we ask for something else or should we ask again after a certain amount of time? So a no is not, it doesn't have to be fatal. It doesn't have to be final. It can be, let's re-strategize and let's regroup and maybe present at a later time. Um, I've just noted that we can go till 3.30, my apologies. I'm not in a rush to leave you guys. So uh, thank, thank you for the person reminding me. <laughs> so. hey, Dan, I love the, the, the question. So a number of people are commenting about the, the national research and data around individual giving versus other types of giving. Uh, it's, a, it's a very healthy dialogue. Uh, the data that Dan and I are quoting is, is straight from the National Institute of Philanthropy or the whoever the large uh, philanthropic uh, watchdogs are. Um, that data, I think it's great to challenge it. I mean, I mean, I think it does 
I think Haley touched upon this. I think it depends on the organization. I think some organizations, smaller organizations, I think with one of the, the comments here in the chat may depend on different revenue sources um, that aren't individual uh, uh, driven and are more driven by other types of revenue. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, are, are perhaps the, the universities and hospitals, uh, the bigger guys, so to speak, or the bigger entities driving that? Perhaps, uh, I'm not here to question it one way or another. Um, I think at the end of the day, it is about relationships, relationship with, uh, with our funders and relationship with our mission and being able to articulate that mission to the funder, whether it's an individual donor, a foundation, uh, corporation, uh, or otherwise, uh, even a government entity, quite honestly. Um, so I think it's, it's, the, it's finding the balance that, that connects with your mission and, and your organization, I think that is, is ultimately that's gonna help sustain uh, your, your own efforts. Um, but knowing how individuals and foundations and corporations are gonna fund and what they fund and why they fund and when they fund will help you be more effective, I think, at the end of the day. You know, one of our uh, one of members of the audience mentioned and did push back on the 80% coming from individuals. And they, they mentioned that a lot of individual giving goes to universities and hospitals. And I think what we have there is the situation of alumni who've spent four years on campus, who've you know, internalized the experience and then the grateful patients or families of patients. Again, they've received a direct benefit, a direct service. Um, for I know a lot of the callers, many are working for smaller organizations, um, we're not providing that same kind of connection or experiential um, opportunity um, for our, our donors and supporters. The other comment I wanna share is the idea of looking at this for the long haul. Um, you know, those individual donors who are providing on an annual basis operating support, smaller gifts, larger gifts, um, they step up over time if we develop that relationship, if we treat them well as donors and as members of our community. Um, they step up when we're ready to run a capital campaign, when we're looking for larger major gifts to help make transitions in an organization. And they step up for the transformational gifts that they might consider closer to the end of their uh, lives or the end of their income earning lives. Um, there are not too many foundations from time to time who you know, make the kind of transformative gift um, uh, that we see um, you know, in the multi-millions of dollars. Um, that is uh, that we often read about in the newspaper, et cetera. Um, so I guess my my overall comment has to do with um, you know from individuals um, building a relationship over a long period of time is, is critical. Often in foundations, as you pointed out, Patrick, they don't want to support operating funds, and they also say, you know, I'll support you for a certain number of years, but then I want you to move on to other organizations and institutions as we shift our priorities, and we don't want any one organization to be dependent upon us as either a major or sole source of fundraising. Hey Dan, one, one other issue that I think uh, you, you, is, an, uh, and I think another point that I think many of us are experiencing, perhaps not all, depending on the organization, there is a challenging um, environment right now, and whether you're large or small, that are fewer people are supporting. We're getting more dollars from fewer people. And you'll hear that frequently in organizations and institutions, and whether how you define that depending on your organization may look a little differently, but it's a universal fact that there are fewer people supporting, uh, giving more. Um, and and that's, a, that's a concern that many of us have. Again, it may be a little different depending on what your nonprofit, what your organization you're representing and who you are. But I do think uh, we have to think differently, creatively, innovatively to connect with the next generation of philanthropists and philanthropy, uh, people that give, why they give and how they give way in which they give. Uh, I think nonprofits are, are slow to the take there. I, I speak to that, looking in the own mirror of, of a religious entity, we're, we're painfully slow there, quite honestly. Uh, and it's something that, uh, you know, we, are, we have an elderly donor base. Um, it's a blessing because those are people that can make transformational gifts, but the pipeline issue is a major concern uh, for us. Uh, again, other nonprofits are in a different position. Um, but that's just something, to, a challenge, a question for all of us as, as we look forward to the next number of years. Haley, any comment? Not on that question. I think that okay. Patrick said all right. it all. <laughs> all right. I'm just reading through some of the comments here. So if anyone does, um, can you provide resources to expand your donor base? Um, we did talk on that already. Um, I think a lot of it is, is again, creativity and really, um, somebody mentioned this before, uh, 
you know, many organizations look at events as an important source of fundraising, and they can be and are. But if you know, if if one were looking at it you know, practically or logistically, um, for the amount of resources necessary to put on an event, um, so for some organizations, you could ac actually hire a fundraiser who could work year round in developing those relationships. I think events are events are really important in developing your donor base and educating your public. Um, you might raise some money at the same time but they should not substitute for the one-on-ones that you've heard a lot talk about today. I guess, um, let me uh, look to the future. Um, there's been a lot of comments both today and other times about how COVID has changed, um, well, has removed sort of the face-to-face, -face, um, probably not permanently, hopefully not permanently. Um, from fundraising and developing relationships. But um, I think we've added the Zoom, added virtual as a tool in our box. How do you see fundraising changing um, sort of post COVID than a pre COVID? And let's avoid COVID. Marcel? Yeah, so, you know, this is an interesting, um, it's a very interesting time to be doing fundraising, especially if you're trying to engage new donors, um, because you just, you know, not being able to have that face-to-face -face conversation, um, you know, presents somewhat of a hurdle, I think, in, you know, the timeliness and expediency of someone being able to engage with your organization. Um, this really is a time to get creative and be, you know, innovative in how you are engaging people. Um, I've seen some things lately that I think, you know, kind of lend themselves well to this current environment. Um, and definitely I would say at the top of that is figuring out how to make some of these virtual engagements feel less like the 200 person Zoom meeting and more like a direct, you know, uh, interaction with people. Um, one of my board members made a donation to a scholarship fund and the president and CEO of the organization actually recorded just a 60 second thank you um, that he sent out to her as a video. Um, and she was able to share it with her husband and her family members. Um, and I just thought that that was really creative, you know, to have your top, um, you know, executive to take the time to do something like that. Um, you know, and, and to be honest, I'm sure he probably recorded 20 different versions of that same, you know, video recording for various individual donors. Um, but man, you know, for that board member, it really felt special to her to have uh, the president and CEO take the time to record that and send it out. Um, we definitely want to figure out ways to make the, the look and feel and touch of our organizations um, feel more intimate. Um, and so something that we did very recently, we have an affordable housing campaign at LMM, um, and we did a um, like a virtual tour of some of the newer houses that we're purchasing and renovating for families experiencing homelessness. But we're also giving people the option, you know, hey, if you'd like to see the house yourself, here are, you know, the locations of where some of our units are, if you want to just drive by and see them yourself. Um, again, to try and bring the, you know, the, the mission and the programs and the works a little bit closer to people so that they can feel like they're a part of something. Um, because, you know, there's on, only so many Zoom meetings and virtual conferences that you can attend before you just feel like everything is just not a reality. And so any way that you can make it feel more like this is a real thing, I can go and see it here. Um, or I can feel it, touch it, experience it in a way that feels more intimate. I think we really have to get creative right now. Um, and even once we reach a point of being able to safely convene again, I think we need to think about, well, who were all the people that we weren't able to touch even before COVID who just had either mobility issues or they were out of town? Um, we now have to really start to think about um, this is an opportunity as well to expand the reach of our mission and to incorporate it in a way for people that may not physically be able to come into the realm of the work that you do. Um, yeah, I mean, taking kind of a, a, a different approach, um, I love what Marcella said. Um, you know, I think that illustrating impact right now is becoming a, a bigger deal. Um, I think that in the past, 
donors haven't needed, haven't cared as much about seeing the impact, but I think that um, our, our newer donors are seeing that, are wanting that a lot more. So I think that the more you can talk with your program staff, get the stories, get the data to back up what's going on, showing the impact, um, I think that it gets people um, more involved. They care more about the work um, or they want to in, invest in you more because they see that what you're doing is impactful. So one thing I've really tried to start doing is, you know, following up with donors, you know, after after they've given, whether it's um, a small or a big donation and giving them some idea of how their donation was able to help. Um, sending pictures, you know, a client story, all those things I think can be really helpful and can help your donors feel more connected with the organization. You know, Dan, one of the things that I think organizationally, I think nonprofits uh, could lean on uh, together in a collaborative, cooperative way is, is there are different um, opportunities for us to partner uh, or even to get message out. We're good areas in the area of plan giving. Um, there's such a huge opportunity uh, that still exists uh, today throughout organizations. And, and we look at it from the perspective that more individuals are considering to make developing a will, leaving charitable organizations in their will, whether it's any one of the many charitable organizations that are part of this call or, or otherwise, ultimately our mission will be raised up depending on whether they're interested in it or not. And so um, I think there are th opportunities to, to promote that broadly in, in, the, in our space together. For example, I don't know if any of you've heard of a program called Free Will. Uh, we partnered, started partnering with them about six months ago it just gets out the message of, of to provide so many donors are not going to necessarily reach out to their own uh, paid professional to develop their will or, or, or whatnot. And so it's an organization we partner with just to get uh, education information out to our benefactors to consider. And again, from our perspective, whether we're going to be the, we, we recognize that we, we may not be the organization necessarily that's going to be the sole beneficiary. Matter of fact, we won't be in most cases. But I think there's opportunities there that may not have existed before. Um, in that arena alone, plan giving, uh, that I, I think we need to take advantage of. Let me, let me ask the follow-up follow question to that, um, especially for smaller shops, with the urgency of securing operating funds on a year-to-year -year basis um, in order to maintain a level of support, a uh, level of services, how does the small shop balance annual fundraising with major gift fundraising, with plan giving, with building endowment, all of which were, are essentially critical to the stability of any organization. But obviously when you, I'm gonna add marketing to that because often the fundraisers are all have a, have a second or third responsibility. I don't know if you guys can address that. I know it's something on the mind of the people who are uh, with us today. Yeah, I'll take a crack at that, Dan. I think that starts with your board um, and developing a strategy and a plan with them uh, in collaboration with the funding available and, and funding opportunities that exist. I think that there is often, you absolutely are correct, I think we all agree that there is a short-sighted um, need, uh, often out of just practical uh, sustainability, that, that uh, we have to raise X this year in order to keep the doors open. And so to ignore that is, is, is not sensible, nor is it uh, a, a way to keep, to keep the, you know, like I said, keep your mission afloat. But you have to balance that. And um, I think board and your funders have to recognize that in order to, 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 to be here for the long term and to have that mission impact that we're all desiring, and it is about impact, we have to be diverse and not just live in the crisis mode of year to year to year uh, and recognize that, that uh, the successful, healthy nonprofit organizations are dependent upon the diverse funding structures that include annual funds, that include opportunities for donors to support through special projects, whether it's capital or otherwise, that include through the establishment of endowments to help sustain and to, and to support, uh, as well as you know other types of longer term gift uh, opportunities. I, I think they all need to be part of a successful, healthy organization's budget and, and, and plan. But you need to do that with the buy-in from your board, your chief executive officer, your fund, key funders, um, because it can be a complex uh, problem and a conundrum that if it's too short-sighted and it's right, you're looking at it from year to year, you're more likely to, to end up in the same place and it feels like a hamster wheel. 
um, uh, year in and year out. So uh, I do think it takes a little bit of planning because you're not going to get a plan go a plan giving program is not going to materialize for you know whether you have three years, five years, depending on what math you want to use there. Uh, you're not going to see the fruits of that labor for a couple of years. And if you think you're going to in year one, that's just, it's, it's, it's not likely. Um, so I think those are the type of honest conversations you have to have with your key leadership. Yeah. If I could add to that, I think, you know, what we're talking about now is also kind of the difference between fundraising and fund development, because fund development is a longer term strategy. Um, you know, and if you can get people to consistently give to your organization by way of your annual fund, then you've successfully started that process. Um, you know, I know when I'm looking at developing a list of potential, you know, people who want to do plan giving or join the Legacy Society, there are certain behaviors that I'm looking for. And so I may initially say, okay, let's pull a list of everyone who has consistently given for five years or seven years. Um, you know, no matter what they've given, even if they've given $20 a year for seven years, to me, that's a stronger candidate for a planned gift than someone who's maybe given $20,000 one time, and that was 10 years ago, um, because it's the consistency that really shows that they're following, they're paying attention, and they um, are keeping track of what we're doing. And those are the people who, you know, in the long term will go from being annual fund donors um, to major gift donors, to plan givers and legacy society members, and who will include your organization in their estate plan. So, you know, that really is the difference between fundraising and fund development is that when you're fundraising, you're just trying to figure out your annual fund. You know, how many people can we get to give? Um, but when you're thinking about a longer term fund development strategy, you start by saying, okay, we had a thousand people give to the annual fund and a hundred of those people have given consistently to the fund for the past seven years. Okay. So that's your, that's your legacy society right there, you know, or this person every year gives a really big gift of $10,000 every November, you know, so start strategizing. Well, what do we want to do with their gift? And can we ask them to give 12,000 next year? So then you start to develop your major gift prospects. And so it really is, it's a pipeline. And again, that lends itself more to fund development as opposed to just that, you know, that push every year to do fundraising. Great point. Great. Right. Let me ask, a, I don't know if it's an interesting question, a bizarre question. Um, you get a grant tomorrow that allows you to spend it on professional fundraising, professional development um, of your fundraising staff or yourselves. Let's focus on yourselves. What do you wanna learn how to do better? You've all had considerable experience in the field, but I think our audience would like to know that we're not complacent or at least we're yearning for more. Um, so for each of you just to address, what is the one thing or few things that um, you would want to improve upon or learn about? in order to do your job better and to get even more satisfaction of the work that you're currently doing. Yeah, I think that um, kind of two thoughts come to mind. One, um, as we're talking about, you know, fundraising versus fund development and planning for the future. So there's a bug, <laughs> I think. Um, um, I think learning kind of the best ways to develop a, a plan and kind of like how to how to put strategies in place that you're going to make sure that that are, that are followed and stuff. I think that, um, you know, I've created a development plan many times and sometimes, you know, things get followed through on and sometimes they don't, but making sure that I'm, you know, preparing the organization for the future in the best way possible. Um, another thing that I've been really interested in lately is just um, developing the best case statements um, and not just an overall case statement, but also case statements for each program and how the um, and how funding for each program would benefit the organization and that in that program. Um, I think that having a case statement for for each one of those things that you can bring to a donor that's specifically interested in helping the kids of your organization or, you know, whatever it might be. I think that having those case statements ready um, is really important. Um, and getting more information about how to how to make that happen. 
So I know for me, I am definitely a big uh, supporter and champion in, in our department um, of continued professional development. Um, when I'm bringing someone on, I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, what are some of the places where they do continued training or continuing education? Um, and so, you know, asking, are you interested in getting the CFRE? Um, you know, those are questions that I ask because I think that when you continue to better yourself and refine your craft, you build your confidence. And oftentimes that's what makes the difference for a fund development professional is having confidence and taking calculated risk. Um, but I think for me personally, if I were looking to, to you know, invest um, in development uh, professionally, it would probably be a deeper dive into estate planning and tax advantageous giving. Um, because for people who are in a certain wealth category, um, oftentimes they, you know, they, I mean, of course they have things that they support um, or causes that they want to champion, but I think it's being able to speak the language that, um, that aligns well with the, the tax benefits of giving charitably, uh, which changes year to year. It changes when, when our president or administration changes. And so that's something that you kind of need to keep an eye towards, you know, what is the tax code around charitable giving and how can you speak the language of people that might be in a position to make a really significant gift to your organization. Um, just being aware of that and, and knowing that it changes, you know, every few years there, there's some new layer of benefit. Um, and so staying on top of that can be a challenge at time. Yeah, Dan, one of the things I, I think would be, it was helpful for me when I did this, gosh, it's been 10 years ago, and I, I would look for the next level now, at, uh, and I'll do a quick plug for Leadership Cleveland, uh, but engaging, I was invited and privileged to go through Leadership Cleveland, and I know going through that process with uh, a number of other uh, leaders in the community, we were fortunate to have David Cooper Ryder uh, do something on AI, uh, pre of inquiry. Uh, and I read the book that they gave us, and it was just, it was a great exercise. It was part of Leadership Cleveland. It, it integrated a, a great networking opportunity with great academic uh, work that David has done, obviously, or has done. I think he's retired now, is he not? Um, but I think it's great to have that academic networking connection point uh, for, at least I find that to be helpful, have found it to be helpful over the years, and, and, and looking for that into the future as well from a management organizational development um, really kind of how, how best to organize and really help find, recruit new people, uh, new innovative ideas, uh, and, and bring those into the workforce and into our, into our own uh, efforts here. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me just address the audience. Um, we're wrapping up. We've got a little over five minutes left. Um, our three panelists have volunteered their time today, sacrificed a great deal. They want to hear from you. So if you could go into the chat and give us any feedback, the good, the bad, and just focus on the good. Um, no, the good, the uh, constructive criticism, um, uh, we would be appreciative. Um, anything you'd like to hear about in the future, I'm sure we'll have future panels as well. Um, I, I love the idea of Leadership Cleveland. I think coming in tangentially from a different angle, um, I'm a huge, huge pro pro uh, proponent of creative thinking and learning everything from design thinking and creative thinking. You know, ideas are the currency of our time. Um, you know, we, we, we know how to build things, but what are the ideas for the future? How do we creatively communicate our messages um, to uh, an audience that's just a lot harder to reach? Um, so if you can take a course in creative thinking, um, I think you'll find that both personally and professionally rewarding. Um, I don't know if you guys have any final comments from our panelists. Um, I do want to thank the Mandel School uh, for putting this together. Um, as always, um, their commitment to um, the social sector, to the nonprofit community is um, not only longstanding, but profound. And I think one of the reasons that Cleveland is so strong in not only fundraising development and nonprofits, but in philanthropy. Um, I think we as professionals and as institutions have inspired this community to be a generous, and I'm sure it'll continue in the future. Um, so I, I turn to a panelist for any final uh, thoughts or uh, comments. Hey, uh, Dan, I saw something, someone uh, commented about the Veritas group. Uh, I'll put a plug in for them too. They've been very helpful for us. I think the, the comment in the chat was they do a number of white papers on a number of these topics. 
I would seco, second and echo if you're looking for a deep dive into philanthropy and how it works and, and the development process, which I think Marcel and Haley both commented upon. That's a great resource and really cool for people. Haley, just want to say goodbye. Yeah, um, that was me about Veritas Group. Honestly, like I have gone through like all their white papers and it's amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's a great resource. Um, just overall, I've learned so much during this panel um, and I was so glad to be able to be part of it. Um, and, you know, I think that we're, we're really doing awesome work in, in fundraising um, and development in, in the nonprofit sector in Cleveland. Um, and just um, thank you all so much for like dedicating your you know, your life's work to helping um, better our community. Marcella, you're on. I would just say thank you to everyone for carving out time to be with us today. Um, and, and I also thank the Mandel School and Case for this opportunity to just share my experience. Um, it, Cleveland is a wonderful community to do fundraising in. And so I would say this is a wonderful career choice. There's a lot of potential. Um, and to just get into it, you know, and to, to enjoy the process um, and, and learn as best you can. And, and the Mendel School and Case are great resources as well. Great. Well, thank you for the panelists. Um, thank you for the audience to take uh, time off during your day. Um, I guess I just want to leave with one thought. And uh, I came across this quotation. It's uh, biblical, but it's one that inspires um, and pardon the gender specificity of it, but it says that he who causes others to go good, do good is greater than the doer. Um, you know, we in this profession are giving others an opportunity to, uh, to do a blessing to, uh, to make our world better. And uh, without the fundraisers, I'm not sure um, we would see the same level of support. Um, so thank you to our audience members who are fundraisers. A few I know are philanthropists um, leading these organizations. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks guys on the panel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.